We can edit this part out. No, we can. Today on the podcast, we're going to try something a little bit different. We are going to have a few short topics before we get to our regular longer topic. First topic, promunism. I sent you a link about this, but you told me you didn't read the whole thing. You didn't send me a link. You said I should Google search it. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so, okay, fine. Tell me if I, I mischaracterize this. So, a school in, was it Mississippi or Alabama? I don't even know. The state doesn't oh, matter to me. Wow. It's out west somewhere. Wow. It was somewhere in the south. Southwest. <laughs> southwest. Um, okay. Maybe it was Arizona. New Mexico, I think. Oh, actually. yeah. It Albuquerque. Yeah, it was Albuquerque. Anyway. <clears throat> so, they do senior proms. Uh, they were voting for a theme, and the students voted for communism theme. And people were outraged, and the administration was like, I don't know if we should let them do this. It's, is that a gen? Is that correct? That's mostly correct. Bam! The <laughs> gave me so much crap yeah. too. <laughs> well, you know, I had a chance to. This is the this is the only correction. The prom was not communist themed at all. It's just the name of the prom they decided would be promunism, which the students voted on. Wait. So, there were a bunch of names. It was just the name. Yeah, it was just the name. It wasn't like people were going to show up dressed as Che Guevara or something. Like, oh, it was I thought they were going to do all their advertising things, like a nice Soviet stuff. How nice would that be? Come to prom for the, you know, for the, <laughs> the six, glory for the, the glory. Yeah. <laughs> the glory of the senior class, you know. Or, oh, no. man. Oh. No, I would have loved that. such a letdown. But... The, it was only the name, so it was, like, a funny pun. Like, I, you can totally see, like, it would be weird, I think, if a high school in the United States had a communist-themed prom. Like, it would have to be, like, in a real... Awesome like, place? Yes. That I wish I would have gone to school at? Yeah, like a, like a really left-wing place, you know, like... Like where we live in Madison, Wisconsin, probably wouldn't happen here. But, you know, like there are these different, there's these little pockets of like really... San Francisco, like maybe. left-wing places in the U.S. Yes, exactly. New York, I could see. But this is just like some town. And they had a bunch of names for their prom. None of which I don't think were very exciting, except for promunism, which is like a pun. Because prom... Starts with the same syllable as communism. At least it rhymes, the first syllable. So, Promunism is kind of a funny title. And apparently, that title, the fact that you would make a pun just based on the word communism, was so odious to the general public. Not only won't let you have a communist theme prom, if you, if just the name has a hint, if it sounds too close to the word communism, it will be an outrage, and it'll be on the news, and people will call and complain to the principal, and they will force you to change the name. Did they have to change it? Yes. That is, I don't think this is hyperbole, fascism. That's fascism. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> That is, that's one of my, wow, and here, this is, that's even worse, because I was thinking it was communist themed, and then I wouldn't, I wasn't terribly surprised that people got all bent out of shape, but just the name, oh, yeah, it could even be like, they could have been like prom plus capitalism, or no. commune, oh man. I, no, the name is now a prom themed prom. <clears throat> That is the name now. I don't now. I don't think the students put up much of a fight in defending the name because I don't think they had bought into it. it. To them, to the students, it wasn't like they were making a political statement. It was just funny. Right. But apparently, 
you can't be funny about communism. Yeah. You, you're not even allowed to joke about it. You just need to <laughs> Man, they par- not talk about it at all, apparently. They need to work on their critical thinking teaching at that school because it should, like, even if they thought it was a joke, huge bells and alarms should be going off when you're going, oh, you can't even name this something like that. That is crazy. Also, how's this for a catch line? A dance from each according to their ability to each according to their need. <laughs> so if you're a really good dancer, you have to dance more? <laughs> right. But everybody needs a little dance, you know, so you're not that awkward kid sitting out. <clears throat> Sorry. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's one of those weird things that conservative, I'm gonna generalize here, warning, uh, conservative, uh, America tends to do. Uh, it's sort of like the gun rights, uh, thing in a way, and that is, it's, I am free, and I am going to use my freedom to oppress your ability to be free in a way that does not conform to my ideal of freedom. Mm hmm. It's freedom, in quotes, by oppression. Yep. Oh, man. That's a good book title. Freedom America, by oppression? Yeah, America, freedom by oppression. Second shorter update. I was listening to NPR, and the story is not really important here. It was just a basic economic story. They have, like, little economic stories sometimes in the morning news show. And it was very interesting to me because one of the anchors was just asking the questions and the other one was providing the content for whatever, like, the new poll or new statistics were. And the question that the one guy asked was, what does this mean for businesses and consumers? And it was very interesting to me that there was no mention of workers whatsoever. The concept of people being workers has been erased from our news and our culture. That all we believe in are businesses and consumers. And while many of the consumers are also workers, we play a very different function when we consume versus when we produce. That's like saying everybody walks so we don't have to mention drivers because everyone's a pedestrian. Well... Many people can be both pedestrians and drivers, and to ignore the worker part of any economic consideration, to me it's not just coincidence, I think it's part of a larger capitalist ideology. In other words, I don't think that NPR sat down and said, we are going to systematically ignore the role of workers in all of our economic updates. It just seems normal to them to not talk about it, because that's what capitalism has done to our media at large, has erased the idea of the worker-employer relationship from most normal broadcasts, and uh, focused on people being primarily, first and foremost, consumers. Well, too, I'd say that goes well hand-in-hand well, hand with... Um the decline of manufacture in this country and the rise of service industry. Because uh, the service industry, it's everyone is consuming. That is why there is such a large service industry, is because you're consuming, consuming, consuming. And it's, you know, consumption, I mean production too, but with service, it's consumption is the main economic driver as opposed to, yeah, manufacture these days. And at least... In America. Yeah, it's more of an echo of the economic realities as opposed to what they actually should be focusing on. But also the idea, not even just businesses and consumers, but businesses and people. Like, you're not seen as just a person. You are seen for your capacity to help the capitalist system move along through your consumption. Like, that's the only real consideration or only real care anybody has about it. Yeah, and it's not that you don't support the capitalist system via your labor, because if you're employed, you are supporting the system via your labor. Not that there's anything 
uh, wrong with being a person that does that. That's how we have to live in a capitalist society. That's what I do. Um, but the but media does not bring up that relationship because that can lead to all sorts of different questions like why is the productive relationship set up this way and who's really in power and what direction is the is power shift going are workers becoming more empowered or less empowered you know if you talk about consumers then you don't have to deal with those questions that that capitalists might not want to have to deal with yeah, and it also, too, it might be a framing issue where they don't want people to identify as a worker. The worker has a natural conflict with uh, the boss, whereas a consumer is an active participant. Mm -hmm. There's no necessary, necessarily an antithetical relationship between a consumer and a business, mm -hmm. but a worker and a business there is. It's easier to be a reporter and remain objective when you're not hitting on those touchy subjects. So that might be part of it as well. Yeah, but I also would argue that, especially when you're talking about an economic thing, <clears throat> um, something that I notice a lot when it comes to economics is economics likes to pretend it's an objective science, mm -hmm. and it isn't. It's All economics is politics, whether or not people want to acknowledge it. It's, it, it is, because... Whether you see things in neoclassical, Keynesian, or or Marxism, there's a politics implied in that. And your analysis, I mean, because the idea of an economic analysis is to provide essentially a policy option for making the economy run whatever you consider to be good for how an economy should run. Which, I mean, just how an economy should run, that's hugely political anyway. And, yeah, so any any economic analysis is always political. I don't think you can have objective economic journalism. Yeah, I say. agree. Okay, that's it for update number two. For our large topic, I want to bring up the topic of police relations with black folks. Because we live in Madison... And recently, we had... An unarmed 19-year-old African-American male was... Was shot by a police officer. And died. And died, yep. I, I don't want to focus too much on the specifics of that particular case, because I'm sure that's something that folks will be hashing through. But it makes me want to talk about the overall theme that we're seeing where these conflicts seem to be becoming more and more prominent, or at least more and more prominent in our media. We're being more aware of them. Well, and we want to look at some of the overriding societal causes and factors and just other things that exist within our society and culture that contribute to these sort of events happening and why they're a big deal and why you don't need to look at one specific instance and why it's just a more general, broad trend, overarching, depressing theme that's related to a lot of other problems in our society. I, I think that's a good point, and I would like to build upon that to say I feel like it comes naturally uh, to myself and probably to to you, Tony, and a lot of other Marxists out there, to want to look at this in a systemic fashion, because that's what Marxists tend to do with, with a, a whole host of issues. That's, you know, the Marxist critique of capitalism is a systemic critique. It doesn't look at the relationship between between one particular capitalist and one particular worker, but rather the system as a whole. And I think that's the right way to go about looking at this particular issue as well. Because folks who want to prove one thing or another can always find a particular situation that will support the point that they're trying to make. Whereas what will likely be more fruitful, or what will hopefully give us a better perspective, is to, to look at the situation as a whole. The first thing I want to begin with is 
the situation that African Americans in the U.S. find themselves today. Even though it's been a long time since we've had slavery in the U.S., and, and we, of course, here in Wisconsin live in the north, so even longer for us than in some parts of the U.S., the, the situation is not particularly good for African Americans. In fact, it's downright awful uh, for many of them. And I, I just pulled up some example statistics. There's a lot that you can look at, so I'm, I'm going to be leaving a lot out, but I want to start by pointing out some of the gaps that our society has when it comes to equality of the races. Because the equality between white Americans and black Americans is a dream. We don't have it. It's, it's anyone who thinks we have it is ignoring the facts, because the facts are... Uh, for example, income. The average income for a white household in the U.S. is $57,000 a year, whereas for a black household, it is only $33,000 a year. It's more than half, but not much more. Just a little bit more than half is what a, a, the typical black household receives in income compared to the typical white one. When it comes to unemployment... Blacks are more than twice as likely to be officially unemployed. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers, which I ha have a strict view of unemployment, this is just looking at officially unemployed by the government's definition, but blacks are tw more than twice as likely than whites to be unemployed nationally. And specifically in Wisconsin, we have a huge gap. If you look state by state, you can see what the breakdown is by state. And some states have no gap. Their unemployment for whites and blacks is equal. The average gap across the nation is that blacks are twice as likely to be unemployed. And in Wisconsin, they, it's, it's double that again. It's about uh, three times as likely for a black person to be unemployed compared to a white person, which puts Wisconsin regularly in one of the most the states with the biggest gap. In fact, in 2011, we were the biggest gap state between white unemployment and black unemployment rates. That coincides with the ending of collective bargaining in Wisconsin, if I am <laughs> not mistaken. Yeah, that could have something to do with it. I don't know for sure. When it comes to incarceration, black people as a whole are nearly six times as likely to be incarcerated as white people. And if you are a black male in Wisconsin, your incarceration rate is twice the national average for black males. So in Wisconsin, you're especially likely to be incarcerated, which which puts you at about one in eight Jeez. for black males. So you've got more than a 10% chance that you're in jail right now or prison if you're a black male in Wisconsin. There's been a lot of reporting recently on suspensions in public schools and how suspensions are not... Evenly, evenly distributed amongst black and white folks. There's been a lot of talk about Milwaukee schools, Milwaukee being the biggest city in Wisconsin, but many schools in general, not just Milwaukee, uh, have really bad disparities in their suspension rates between African Americans and white Americans. So that's the situation that we start with, is that America does not treat the two races equally. And I, I think that there's really two, well, I'm going to say three different responses that you can have when faced with these statistics. You can have the most racist of all responses, which is to say that those differences are because the races are inherently different and that some are just smarter, wiser, or more, more deserving. That would be the outright racist stance to take, which most people don't do to, an, anymore today. That's become not acceptable to, to say in public. Most but, of the time. Mm -hmm. 
And Unless then, you're talking about Muslim Americans. Yeah. And, and then terrorism. It's okay. And then it's okay. And then there's the uh, middle stance, the conservative stance that you are allowed to say today, which is to just simply ignore the statistics. Faced with all of that information, to just not think about it, not worry about it, to say things like, I don't see race, I don't consider race, I don't think about it. That sounds fairly acceptable to say, I just don't think about race, I make my decisions based not on race. But when you say when you're saying that is, I'm ignoring these disparities. I can look at this incarceration rate and say, well, I'm just not going to think about how that's not fair because I'm not going to worry about whether or not we we imprison more black people than white people. Yeah. I would say that view is more broad than just conservative because I have heard plenty liberal people espouse that. I literally yeah. had within this week someone tell me they do not see color when it comes to things in uh, discussing this uh, shooting. So saying you don't see color... Not only are you saying that you aren't paying attention to these discrepancies which are disturbing and dismissing the actual lived experience of all of these people that have to deal with these disparities on a day-to-day -day basis, but you're also probably just straight up lying. No, it's it's, some, it's oh. not something that you can choose not to notice. You know, whether or not you notice something is not your choice it's something that will happen like if if i'm trying to sleep and the sun and the sun shines on my face it's not a mental decision whether or not i notice that it's going to happen either way and i i can try to say that i don't notice it but i will so i i i think that not only is it the wrong thing to say because you're discounting all of this it's also just straight up not true yeah. Well, and two, in a way, it almost seems for that response, which is alarmingly not uncommon, it's in a way also saying, essentially, you don't see or care about people who aren't white, because it's always white people that I have seen say that. I don't think I've ever seen anybody who isn't white say that. It's essentially, not only are you ignoring the issues, you're essentially ignoring them, mm -hmm. as if you just don't see non-white people. <laughs> Yeah, that's another way to understand that phrase. Yeah. What was the third one? You said there were three. The third stance that you can take when faced with these statistics is to say, society is racist. That's the other conclusion that you can come to. So you can say people are, th that these, these numbers reflect uh, an inherent difference between the races. You can ignore them. Or you can say, well, the races are inherently equal, so the only thing that can be causing this would be something society is doing, like being racist or whatever. And many of these fit together. So, for example, once you have been incarcerated, that's going to increase your chance of being unemployed because it's hard to get a job once you are labeled as a criminal. Even though it's technically illegal to discriminate against someone due to a uh, past incarceration. Mm. And and I think uh, other things play into the dis discrepancies in education, discrepancies of income. We didn't talk about health statistics, but health statistics also have a, an extreme disparity, and those tie in very strongly with income as well. So if you look at... Income and types of jobs you get, too. Because yeah. if you are only working, you know... Uh, wage work as opposed to salary, you're less likely to have health care along with it. Mm -hmm. Although I'd be curious to see how, if the Affordable Care Act and its limited capacity to offer some more people health care, if that will have any impact on those numbers. The next thing I want to shift to is a focus on, given the situation of of whites versus the situation of blacks, what little are we doing about it and what direction are we going? And I think n this is where we need to talk about all sorts of government priorities. So our government has a bunch of different things that it does, 
but different governments choose different priorities. And so things get more funding or less funding over time uh, based on the priorities uh, of those that we elect. And I wanted to bring up some interesting trends recently in the funding uh, for things that may have an effect on helping make society more equal. This is just another an example, just like with the distinction between how the lived lives of white people versus black people. I only highlighted a few examples. Here's just a couple of examples of the trends recently in, in what we're doing as a society. Nationally, here in the U.S., we saw a $5 billion cut to food stamps with an additional $6 billion coming in the next two years. And, and this was done at, at the national level with, without a veto from Obama. Things that may help those who are paid less or have, uh, be unemployed. You know, people who need that kind of support are not going to be receiving it because of these major cuts. And in fact, the report where I got these, the numbers 5 billion and 6 billion, Al Jazeera reported it. And uh, they had a good quote in the article that I had to write down. They said that the outcome of this would be forcing people into serious hardship, which, I mean, I'm sure you know if, if you need food stamps and you don't have them anymore, that would be a serious hardship. An additional cut that we saw recently was here in Wisconsin, our state Medicaid program, which provides health care to the working poor folks generally. We saw a total of 90,000 people cut from state Medicaid. And so people that rely on that state Medicaid program for their health insurance to provide them coverage for doctor's visits and other medical care that they may need, while 90,000 people no longer have that coverage, thus putting them into much more difficult situations. I will happily report that I did not, I, uh, I made the cut and am able to keep mine because, uh, we're, my family is on, uh, Badger Care, which is what they call the program. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we had paperwork that we had to resend in all of our stuff because they were debating whether or not to cut us out. So. I'm glad to hear that you're still covered. Me too. But <laughs> <laughs> it's good, especially when you're sick like I have been. Yeah. Another, the last one that I'll highlight, is uh, one of the more recent cuts that is being discussed heatedly here in Wisconsin, is our governor proposed a $300 million cut to the state university system, which serves primarily white students, but when, when the university is faced with a cut of that size, balancing their budget will be objective number one and any other objectives like having a di diverse student body or offering scholarships to to maintain that or serving the needs of people regardless of their ability to pay those are things that you can't do if you can't balance your budget yeah it should also be mentioned that it is illegal at the moment for public universities to raise their tuition so there's no way that they can actually make the gap up in any other way beside cuts. Mm -hmm. And raising the tuition would also have major problems with it as well, oh, yeah. where you'd be pricing out many of these students who are not coming from a background with a, with a high income. Yeah. So we have a system that makes a awful situation for minorities, especially black people. And what we've decided to do about that is to cut the programs and cut the things that could potentially make it better. So we've taken a group of people and said, we don't value you. We don't think about you. You know, not, uh, no, not me personally or anything like that. No one's gone on TV to say that, but based on our actual outcomes in our society and then what our elected officials choose to do what they prioritize in their budgets we're saying 
We never have cared about you, and now we care even less. And even the rhetoric is, I think, the rhetoric that they do use for some of this stuff is that, what do they say, a kick in the butt. It's that people who are on these things are inherently lazy. And I think it's also worth noting with this stuff is that it disproportionately uh, affects African Americans, but the largest group of welfare recipients is white people. Mm -hmm. Like, that's something that's ignored because the way it's framed, especially by politicians and in the media, is it's almost always framed as uh, an issue of minorities as opposed to... It's actually a lot of uh, rural white people. Mm -hmm. Of course... The, what's interesting about that is that the politician is banking on their constituency's racism, or or maybe it's a media outlet. Sometimes it's not a politician, but a media outlet that that whips this up. You Fox say Fox News, News that's exactly. yeah. Uh But they're banking on the racism of their audience to change policy that can hurt white people and black people alike. But they pass it through with the assistance of their viewers racism who oftentimes are people who are the white people receiving that stuff like um mm -hmm. uh, i don't know the guy's name off the top of my head but the the tv show coach did you ever see that when no. you were younger oh i'm gonna craig t nelson there's an awesome clip that we'll have to put up on uh the thing of him on fox news saying I was on food stamps. I was on Medicare. Did anybody help me out? No. So it's it's that in talking about these exact issues, it's that framing it. It's it's the people who aren't white. They're they're the ones with the problem, and it's not uh, it's the white people do it themselves sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So then, when you've got a society who is said to a population. We don't care about you, we don't value you, and we're going to start treating you even worse. To me, that means that you're, you're giving up on, on those folks buying into the system. And so it's not surprising to me if we're, if, if in the next however many years, then in, that in the future here, we're going to see more and more conflicts between black people and a police force. Because when when society has turned its back on you, then you're more likely to to resort to any means necessary to get what you need to get. And if you don't think that you can get a job anyway, then it's not such a deterrent to, you know, go to prison and have that on your record. Well, it's like if you take my situation where I'm at and then look at it from the fact that I am white, I come from a middle class background. So where I'm at now is my wife and son and soon to be another son are living uh, at my parents' house. If we were African American, we probably wouldn't our family probably just would not have the means because their income would not be at the same level generally where they would be able to help support us like that. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, the recourse I would be faced with would be uh, it's hard for me to get a job, which it just is anyway, hard to get jobs these days. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let my wife or kid or me starve. You know, you're going to go to some sort of secondary economy as opposed to engaging in the primary economy when that shuts you out. Mm-hmm. If society isn't providing for people, I mean, the people aren't just going to go, oh, well, I can't get a job anywhere, and I'm unemployed for this long time and can't make rent, so I'm just going to let my, nobody's going to go, yeah. oh, I'm just going to let I'm myself I'm just going to behave and yep. slowly die. Yep, yep. No, I'm no. going to starve to death, watch yeah. my kids die and be sick and unhappy, and, you know, that's that's cool. I'm going to do that. Yeah. No, you're going to find a way to do stuff. You're going to do exactly what the rich people often charge poor people especially anybody who engages in criminal activity with not doing, and that is they're going to pull themselves up and get a job that's not necessarily legal or mm -hmm. find a way to provide for themselves and their families. Yep. Along those same lines, 
a friend of mine said it once, and I thought in a good way in a discussion, where somebody was asking about how come so many pizza delivery guys smoke marijuana, was the question of the discussion. And uh, my friend said, well, if you were a grown adult man who thought you probably should have a career job or whatever you want to call it by then, and you were still delivering pizza, wouldn't you just want to be high and forget about it? And it's like, yeah, probably that makes sense. Like, if you are frustrated and not allowed to achieve what you want to achieve, the idea that you might turn to a drug for comfort makes sense. When you're looking at it from a societal standpoint, you have to understand that when you continually write people off and and ignore them and their needs you're going to end up with a greater amount of illegal activity of drug use and of things like that there's a book called the hand to mouth living in bootstrap america and i think she provides a pretty good description of that sort of stuff because she's poor and the whole thing is just is a poor person just telling her story about being poor and what it's like to be poor and being honest and about talking about smoking and how their poor people are chastised for you know the amount of money it costs and how unhealthy it is and her response is essentially well who cares it decreases my stress it's the one little bit of time to myself and pleasure i actually get in my long crappy day Mm -hmm. so i am going to smoke even if it kills me younger, because I'm probably not going to live as long anyway, because I just don't have access to the same amount of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's that it's that sort of thing that I think Michael Harrington in The Other America, which I haven't read and probably should, um, I believe he talked about the culture of poverty. I think he was borrowing the term from an anthrop- anthropologist or sociologist. Mm-hmm. And I know that this has been re and misappropriated by the right wing, but talking about how stereotypically there's a higher drug use amongst poor people is because you're looking for some way to escape your crappy situation. Now, mm-hmm. the right wing takes that and goes, well, obviously that's the cause of their situation, not a result of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no one, no one is on Fox News complaining about a bunch of millionaires snorting coke or like, drinking martinis or something like that but yeah if a poor person has a cigarette wow that's that's yeah. just the total that's the cause of all their problems right there apparently. or even or even uh your example of smoking pot i mean it's much better that um somebody smokes pot than has like a beer because that's actually has a lot of medicinal purposes and is like just not as unhealthy for you as drinking is which is kind of interesting yeah especially for something still so demonized or with upcoming in our state is they're going to push for the drug testing for welfare recipients again disproportionately will affect african-american people not because they disproportionately use drugs but because it's such an onerous and insulting thing to do and not only that i don't i haven't seen exactly how they're going to set up but a lot of states charge you if you're doing the, getting the test. Oh, you have to pay for your own yep. test. Yep. Yeah. Even even if you turn up positive or turn up negative, which the majority of people on welfare, they're statistically less likely to use drugs than the average of society. But we don't make most of society pass a drug test to get their check or whatever their yeah, their tax break. Yeah. If you're a millionaire, you yeah. don't have to. Make sure, yeah, you're not snorting coke if you're a billionaire. Yeah, to collect your div- dividends or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think that all needs to be understood as part of the discussion. And then the last thing I want to get to is the the idea that right now it seems to be really focused on the relation of the police with the black community, which I think is also a problem to I think it's a problem to limit the discussion to that because I feel like all of this plays into one large system 
you know, it's something that the police need to work on, but it's something so many professions need to work on to improve society, to make our society more equal amongst races. For example, we can't just ba- blame police when a black person with the same finances as a white person can't get a loan. Or when a teacher doesn't know it in their conscious mind, but unconsciously or subconsciously expects less from a black student. There's a lot of research out there to show how expectations of people can completely influence the outcome. In fact, this was the most interesting. I heard of a study with lab rats recently, where if you tell the researchers, these lab rats are smart ones, and these lab rats are the dumb ones, and then you make them run a maze, just like all of this little subtle body language and handling of the rats and everything like that actually makes the rat run faster if you think they're smart because you treat them differently. Even though you don't, like, speak the same language as the rat or whatever. I guess the rat doesn't speak a language, but you get what I'm saying. Like, expectations are huge in the actual outcome of what people do. And so if through media or whatever you're taught to think that black people are thugs or lazy or not smart or superstitious or whatever, all of the different things that are portrayed in media and and also just through general racism in society, it's a problem that, that makes it a problem with teachers and their expectations of students, with the suspension rates that we talked about, that plays into that, with whether or not people are hired, if they appear that they will be a good worker, with all sorts of different things, I, there's barely any end to the number of professions that this touches and plays into. So I think it's, you know, I don't want to write off the police thing and say, we can't talk about that. I think it needs to be part of the discussion, but it's really limiting to the discussion as a whole to only talk about that one facet. Yeah, well, and especially, too, when you look at what is what does the police do? You know, people normally say they're peacekeepers, but they are the executors of the law. Their job is to enforce laws. So if they act, even if the individual officer isn't racist, but if the outcome of their actions are vastly disproportional in response to one person's ethnicity over another, that's because the laws are set up to be vastly disproportional from one to the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in itself should be a big key to people that it's more than just policing because it's, it's the laws. I think the most, the, the, the like standard go to really clear example of that is the difference in fines and jail time between crack cocaine and What's the other one called? Powder cocaine? See that? I don't even, I know so little about drugs. Yeah, crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. I said that right? Yeah. You think so? Okay. <laughs> so apparently it's like rich white guys that have the powder stuff and poor black people on the whole that have the, the crack cocaine. And even though they're chemically extremely similar, the sentencing is extremely harsh, much harsher for the crack cocaine. So that's like a really easy example of disparity in the law. But I want to say that it goes more beyond just the written letter of the law. Oh, yeah. Like, when the law can be written in a way that looks equal on paper, but when you take all of these unconscious biases that we have, Part of the problem is people that aren't willing to admit that that is a thing that exists in society. You know, if you have ever watched TV or movies or anything like that, if you're a member of our society, you're exposed to all of these little subconscious indicators that, you know, pieces of media that tell you black guys are criminals and they're strong and they're scary and blah, 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 blah. And to say that you can just ignore that, that's not really true. You are affected by the media that you watch, and it plays into how you act as a person. And I'm, I 
I can't say that that means that it's your fault. I mean, that's the way our society is. But it means that it's something that we need to work to address as a society, because if we don't, we're just letting it be bad and stay bad and fester and possibly get worse. So, Tony, I think we did a good job of describing the situation, where we're headed with the situation, and we talked a little bit about a solution, mainly just that the direction of the solution must be wide in scope. It needs to involve not just police relations, but also educational policy, financial policy, government policy, and, and, and media and all sorts of things. But for this particular episode, we won't get into specifics about that. What I'd like to do, though, is invite our listeners to help provide an answer to, to the question of what should we do to make a racially equal society. And so I, I invite you to leave a comment on our Reddit, our Facebook, or our WordPress about what do you think is an integral part of the solution. You know, if you can concisely solve <clears throat> all the problems of racial disparity in 500 words or less. 500 words? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I was going to go like Twitter, like 144 characters. 144 characters. No, but, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's the, the answer is probably we won't have an answer, even with an extremely long discussion, but... I think the discussion is something that needs to happen because that right now there's too many people just ignoring the problem or pretending that there simply isn't even a problem. So just discussing what the answer could be is, is the right thing to do. So leave a comment with your thoughts. Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt, and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA, and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at Red Wagner 2, that's the number 2, and Schmidt AJ, that's S-C-H-M-I-T-T-A-J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com. You can share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday. Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash DSA Madison. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.